This is a 1966 Ford GT40 Mark II that was raced at Le Mans. Let's take a look inside. To open it up, you push right here to reveal the handle and pull to open the door, which you'll see takes a good bit of the roof with it to make getting in and out easier. Can you imagine doing a 24 hour race in this? It's absolutely crazy what race car drivers did back in the day. Check out those hot button seats and how close the gated shifter is to the wheel. This is such an awesome piece of history from the golden era of racing. This is a real 1964 Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe. Let's take a look inside. This car is a piece of automotive royalty and it's crazy that we're getting to do this. To get inside, you reach your hand through this window and you'll see there is a latch just above the wheel well. Gently lift that up and the door pops open for you. By the way, this door is incredibly light and it can't weigh more than a pound. To get inside, you have to lead with your right foot, plant it on the floor, turn your hips, get your butt in the seat, work your knees underneath the steering wheel, and then you're in. Once you're inside, you will see that this absolutely was a prototype race car. There is little to nothing in the interior for creature comforts because this car was built solely to go fast. In front of you on the dash, you have a series of gauges, including your tachometer, your oil pressure, your ampere meter, and more. To your right, you'll find the shifter for the car's four-speed manual transmission mounted on the drive shaft tunnel, as well as the passenger bucket seat. Behind, you'll find a fire extinguisher and the spare tire that was required for racing regulation back in the day. It's a little cramped, but at 6'2", it's not the worst fit in the world. Back in the day, Maserati made gorgeous race cars and I wish they would do it again. Nowadays, Maserati is focused on being a lower cost luxury brand, but this 1957 300S shows a glimpse into their golden era when they were focused on being the best car on the track. This 300S only weighs about 1,700 pounds with its all aluminum body and puts out 260 horsepower out of a three liter straight six, which is about 300 pounds lighter and 70 more horsepower than a series two Lotus Elise. There are very few creature comforts inside this purpose-built race car and it definitely shows, but it still looks amazing and I wish the brand could revive the reputation they had when they made cars like this. This is the most important Bugatti ever made. This is the 1936 Bugatti 57G tank and it was the overall winner at the 1937 24 Hours of Le Mans. Only three original 57G tanks were built and this is the only surviving car. It was known as the aerodynamic mule due to its unique body styling and it was the first Bugatti to win a major race as well as set many distance and speed records that stood for almost 30 years. It survived World War II by being hidden from the Germans and eventually made its way to the United States where it now resides at the Simeon Museum in Philadelphia where it's on permanent public display. Bugatti has even honored this car with special edition Veyron models, and it is without a doubt one of the greatest cars in automotive history. Did you know this race car had to be built in secret? This is a 1963 Corvette Grand Sport of which only five were ever built and this is one of only two roadsters that exist. In the early 1960s, General Motors had put a ban on factory team race cars. However, Zora Arcus Duntov and several GM engineers had these Grand Sports built in secret and sold to privateers to see what this new Corvette could do on the track. The Grand Sports saw success at Nassau Speed Week and eventually made their way to class wins at Sebring in later years. But once GM's management got wind of their participation in races, they brought the ban hand and shut down the program. The Grand Sports remain some of, if not the most sought after Corvettes ever made, and this one is so cool to see in person. Here's part two with the Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe. Taking a look under the hood, you will find the heart of the Daytona Coupe, a small block Ford 4.7 liter or 289 cubic inch V8 that produces 385 horsepower. If you look on the roof of the car, you will see it's been signed by Carroll Shelby, Phil Hill, Bob Bondurant, and more. This car was the first of only six original Cobra Daytona Coupes built and the only one built entirely by Shelby American. It was raced at Daytona, Le Mans, Spa, and it even won its class at the 1964 12 Hours of Sebring. It is the only surviving Daytona Coupe that has not been fully restored and it is an amazing piece of history to see in person. Let us know what else you want to see on the car and follow for more up-close looks at some of the most incredible cars in the world. Have you ever wondered how to get into a $10 million Jaguar D-Type? Let me show you how. Since the D-Type has an incredibly streamlined body, it's not totally obvious how you get into the driver's seat without jumping over the windscreen. The first thing you want to do is reach over the body and find a small handle located inside this pocket. Lift that upwards and the door panel will open right up for you. Next, hand the door off to your friend to hold it open, don't forget to say thank you, and step in with your left leg. Try to get that all the way past the steering wheel and then place your hands on the transmission tunnel in the back of your seat to hold yourself up. Then slowly bring your other leg into the footwell before lowering yourself down into the seat. And lastly, hold the latch open as you close the door behind you. Congrats, you're now sitting inside a Jaguar D-Type. Whoa, check out this 1970 Plymouth Superbird. This car was known as one of the Arrow Warriors for its tapered front nose and this giant wing on the back. This one has a 7.2 liter Hemi V8 and is over 18 feet long. 
Can you believe these raced in NASCAR? Everything about it is absolutely crazy. All right, I want to give you all a second look at just how massive the rear wing is on this 70 Superbird. The wing rises a full two feet above the rear decklet of this car. I'm six foot two and it just about comes up to my chin. Some engineers at Chrysler have said that the wing was made this large so that the top fin would clear the top of the car and be in clear air, while other interviews have said that it was built this large to provide clearance for the trunk to open. Isn't it crazy just how far aerodynamics have come? Either way, it's an insane detail that makes this already incredible car stand out amongst any crowd. Have you ever seen a 300SL Gullwing up close? Well, let me show you around this one. This is a 1956 300SL and the car has the nickname Gullwing from these unique roof hinged opening doors. To open it up, you push on this piece of metal that protrudes out of the door, pull on the handle that pops out and let the hydraulics guide it upwards. This car is highly original showing a lot of its age, but it is still in great condition, especially since it was used as a regular driver in Philadelphia for many years. But luckily these tires look like they could handle a pothole or two. I think this is one absolutely gorgeous sports car, but what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Hey everyone, check out this 1935 Auburn 851 Boattail Speedster. The 851 Speedster was designed by Gordon Burig and is known as a boat tail for its tapered rear end and flowing bodywork. This car is an icon of 1930s Art Deco design and it is one of the few attempts at building a sports car by an American manufacturer from this time period. This car is powered by a 4.5 liter supercharged straight 8 engine and was sold with a guarantee that it could reach 100 miles per hour. This one is in highly original condition and is an awesome blast from the past to see. Do you like the Art Deco design? Let me know in the comments. This is a 1958 Ferrari 250 Testarossa and it's not only one of the most gorgeous cars in the world but also one of the most expensive with some price estimates ranging over 40 million dollars. Let's take a look inside. Walk over to this side of the car, reach over the door and give the latch inside a good tug sideways and it'll open up. You might think that since this car doesn't have a roof, it should be easy to get into, but it's actually the exact opposite. If you don't want to step on the seat, you have to get your right leg completely in and around the steering wheel, hold yourself up with both hands on either the seat bolsters or the transmission tunnel, lift your other leg up into the footwell, and finally lower yourself down into the seat. Congrats, you're now sitting in a 250 Testarossa. To your right, you have the gear shift for the car's four-speed manual transmission. First is to your top left down into second, which can get a bit stuck coming out of it, up into your right is third, and down to the right is fourth. There is also a reverse gear on the far top right with a manual lockout switch. This was one of the fanciest cars you could buy in the 1930s. This is a 1936 Bugatti Type 57 Adelante and it was custom built to be as luxurious and high performance as possible. It is as decadent as can be both inside and out with its gorgeous Art Deco design and is powered by a straight 8 engine producing 160 horsepower. This car is one of only 34 factory bodied Type 57 Adelantes built for 1936, so it's very rare and super cool to see in person. Would you rather have this or a Duesenberg? Let me know in the comments below. This is the only Porsche 917 long tail in the world that's in private hands. The 917 was built solely to give Porsche an overall win at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which it did in 1970 and 1971, but only a few long tail versions like this were ever built. The long tail body gave the car better aerodynamics and helped it reach speeds up to 240 miles per hour. It's powered by a 600 horsepower flat 12 engine and is as light as can be coming in at right around 1800 pounds dry. This is the only long tail 917 in existence that is not owned by Porsche and it was last sold at auction in 1998 for just over one million dollars with current valuations placing this car at well over 20 million but even if you have the cash she's not for sale hey everyone today I want to show you the engine bay on a Porsche 917 long tail let's take a look as you will see, we've got the rear deck lid propped open. One of the first things I want to show you is just how small these chassis rails are. This tube frame is incredibly light and the car might as well be made out of pipe cleaners. It is absolutely crazy how lightweight this thing is. On top of the engine, you will see there is a giant fan, meaning this is air cooled. This is a flat 12 engine that produces 600 horsepower. This engine could push the car up to speeds over 240 miles per hour at Le Mans and it is just crazy to see up close. This has to be one of the craziest engines I've ever seen in a car. 
Do you know why GT40s have this specific piece of bodywork? It actually fixed a pretty important problem. The GT40 was built so Ford could beat Ferrari at Le Mans and got its name because it was only 40 inches tall. However, when 6'4 racing driver Dan Gurney tried to drive one, the car was too small for him to fit in with his helmet on. To fix this, master fabricator Phil Remington installed this bubble to add a few extra inches to the roof of the car, allowing Gurney to fit inside. Thus, this piece of bodywork became known as the Gurney Bubble. So always remember to duck next time you're closing the door on your GT40.